the idea was that this was going to be the Bell Labs memo that never was. It would never be released. So said the lawyers, because it was too sensitive. For 33 years, this was all that we had. And I suppose in modern parlance, it became a sort of reverse engineering jailbreak, as you might say. Many of you know far better than I do already about the two big heroes of uh, Dennis Ritchie and Ken Thompson. There's a third person we're going to bring in today, and the one, if you like, at Bell Labs that I know really, really well for more than 30 years now. That, of course, is Brian Kernighan. And I think, uh, if only from this book here, those of you who haven't heard of him may suddenly say, oh yes, probably the third best known person in the Unix firmament after Dennis and Ken. One of the suspects you'll recognise straight away is me. The one at the far right is my colleague Steve, who features later on in this story. And the person in the middle there, the bearded gentleman, is Brian, Brian Kernighan. That's taken about three years ago when we visited Brian and it's in a coffee shop just off the main campus of Princeton University. And when you look through the version 7 Unix manual, the thing that really struck you was that at Bell Labs, they not only could afford BDP-11s, Vaxes and all sorts of stuff, but they could afford typesetters. It's hard to realise nowadays what that meant. Laser printers had not been invented. At best, if you were lucky, you could get a good, if you like, dot matrix printer effect. But actually getting Times Roman, Courier, Zapf Chancery, Helvetica, Ariel, whatever turns you on, no, that was not in the compass of normal mortals because it cost a heck of a lot of money. So what we're going to take a look at today is how and why Bell Labs had typesetters, what they did with them, and how they really were instrumental in making typesetting democratic for the rest of us. It was very early work, but it was massively influential. And one of the people who led the charge on that, because he did a lot of the work himself, and he was kind of informally the leader of the typesetting software effort at Bell Labs was Brian, Brian Kernighan. Bell Labs' choice of third generation typesetter would only cost $50,000 in 1979 money, which is just horrendous to think of. By comparison, you could easily buy a house. You could easily buy a house for $50,000 in a really very good one, I would think. Yeah. Um, they looked long and hard at what was available and decided that they would go with Mergen Tyler and this machine, UK design, is called the Linotronic 202. This was the one step before laser printers came on the scene. Naked Mini, two floppy disk drives, control console, paper tape. Here is a board from the Naked Mini. And it shows you very definitely how solidly mini computer the computational facilities were. And there's all of the boards that comprise the Naked Mini. Receptor cassette fed from bromide paper at the back, hidden under there, high res cathode ray tube, 972 dots to the inch, and shaped a bit like a letterbox in many ways. You exposed the bromide paper in bands. And when you'd finished doing the current band, you mechanically moved the bromide away from it. At huge cost from either Linotype or some other supplier, you bought a bromide or film processor. You took along your cassette, you fed it in to the end of this thing, which had three separate tanks. Smelly developer with, uh, well, uh, yes, I can smell it even now. Wash water in the middle after the developing was done of the image, and then, of course, fixer at the end. And the fixer smelt the worst of all. There's a sort of faintly acidic smell about it. Then it came out at the end. It probably had another wash at the end. And then it went through a dryer, or you hung it up to dry. And then, finally, you've got your beautiful bromide output, which you could slice up and uh, make it into page size slices. What you then did with it was, if you just wanted to send a proof of what you typeset out to all your friends, there were, of course, Xerox and other photocopies around. You could photocopy the bromide output. Uh, but if you wanted really high quality and you were doing a long print run, what you would have to do at this generation, 
was to send your photographic output off to a plate maker that would convert your photograph into an offset printer metal plate. The idea is you have a plate on a cylindrical drum which rolls round and round at very high speed and can print off tens of thousands of copies of things like newspapers or whatever. So that's basically the technology behind third generation cathode ray tube driven typesetters. And as far as Bell Labs are concerned, it just changed everything because with the ability to be imaging onto a cathode ray tube, you could not just have the ability to use preset fonts like in earlier generations, you know, letter S's and magnified to various sizes. You got all of that, but you had the ability to draw lines. You could do primitive line graphics. And certainly Brian and others at Bell Labs really, really wanted to do that. They could see the potential straight away. But in terms of getting the full value out of this, what they naively perhaps thought shouldn't be too much trouble was to ask Mergenthal very nicely if they would let them have the spec for how the digital fonts were held on floppy disks. Why, said Mergenthaler, because we want to create our own, they said. Well, I gather the roof fell in. It, total, total, total disbelief. Why would you want to do that? You know, this isn't a machine for amateurs. One example of the fonts that they wanted was a set of chess pieces. This is the time to bring in one of our other heroes, Ken Thompson, already mentioned in the previous Unix video, he was part of Brian's team for commissioning the 202 typesetter. It was led by Brian himself, of course, and crucially, they also had a hardware man called Joe Condon, very talented hardware engineer. Some of you will know that Joe Condon and Ken Thompson were famous just before this era, mid 70s, of creating the Bell chess machine. Ken was there, a sort of ultimate software guru who was mad keen to create his own chess font and also very happy to get deep into the Linotron as deep was needed. Mergenthaler just said, I'm sorry, gentlemen, it's a flat no. We are not going to reveal to you how our fonts are done. Yeah, yeah, we thoroughly accept your Bell Labs, you know, you have enough hassle from antitrust legislation. We know you are not going to set yourself up as rivals. You're not going to become just a font shop and, uh, you know, do cheaper fonts now. As we know, we accept it. But nevertheless, there was a feeling, rightly, I think, in Mergenthaler, that this was like opening Pandora's box. Even though these three talented chaps at Bell Labs were quite prepared to sign every non-disclosure agreement going, the answer was firmly no, absolutely no. So they basically said, well, we're going to do it anyway. And I suppose in modern parlance, it became a sort of reverse engineering jailbreak, as you might say. Uh, the, the wisdom from Mergenthaler was you'll never do it, you know. Our fonts are not deliberately encrypted, but they are so compressed and so compact and in such, such an obscure format, you will not succeed in deciphering how we do it and why we do it. To which I think Brian probably muttered under his breath, what you don't know is I've got a secret weapon and it's not a piece of hardware, it's called Ken Thompson. It took Ken, with some help from Brian, who always underplays his own role in this, basically between two and three weeks to get the overall idea of how it all worked. It took about six weeks for total knowledge, but that included complete knowledge of exactly what the resolution was of that CRT, the timings, everything. You just wouldn't have wanted a more talented team to prove that this could be done. They created their own fonts. Ken did his chess font. There were no chess fonts available at the time. There's hundreds of them now. In an email he sent to me, he said, well, I just wanted to do something really quickly because I wanted to publish books and I wanted a proper chess font. Herman Zapf's Palatino, but there is Ken Thompson's chess font in action. The whole of this book, all done on the line of type 202. So that is one of the rationales for wanting to be able to do your own fonts. Brian and I have traditionally referred to this work that he did as the vacation project, right? Because it was in the vacation period in the middle of 1979 that they spent their six weeks reverse engineering the 202. But when it came to the turn of 1980, 
Brian was absolutely adamant that he wanted to write a memo about not the fine details of how it had been done, but just the overall picture saying, we did it, this is what we can now do, isn't it wonderful? Not in any way to be anti Mergenthaler, although <laughs> their version of the 202 was very, very unreliable, as you'll be able to read in this memo. We'll try and set up some web pointers for you as part of this uh, video so you can read it for yourselves. But he just wanted to tell the story. Mergenthaler got wind of it and basically said no, absolutely no, got in touch with Bell Labs lawyers and to cut a long story short, it was suppressed. The idea was that this was going to be the Bell Labs memo that never was. It would never be released, so said the lawyers, because it was too sensitive. But it was, with hindsight, a real point to the future when fonts would become commonplace within the laser printer era and so on. For 33 years, this was all that we had as the hard copy evidence of the technical memorandum. The thing I'm kicking myself for now is that I didn't actually keep any bromide. I've got lots of other bits and pieces here. I've got font books for the supplied with the Linotype 202, but I didn't actually keep any proper bromide, and nor, it would seem, did Brian. Because here, this isn't the bromide, it's an nth order photocopy of the bromide off the 202. And you can see what's happened. Every photocopying process adds so many percent to the apparent boldness. Bits have got chopped off and truncated off the bottom. Filing marks here. However, as you turn over, you can begin to see just what was turning them on about the abilities of the 202. For the first time, using Brian's PIC preprocessor, they could draw a line diagram of how it worked on the 202. Look, cathode ray tube, 16-bit naked mini, driving it, floppy disk, character definitions on. Integrated line diagram output, not stuff that you had to have drawn by an artist and pasted in and made a plate of or whatever afterwards. The governing organisation, if you like, for what's left of Bell Labs is now called Alcatel Lucent. So I suggested to Brian and a good mutual friend, Chuck Bigelow, typographer, said, yeah, yeah, you, you guys ought to do this. I said, why don't we ask the powers that be for permission? It's, it's not sensitive anymore, 33 years after the event, please can we recreate the vacation memo, as we came to call it. The really big plus point, of course, was that it was typeset in this typesetter version of that original runoff program, TROF, the typesetter version of ROF. TROF can be equipped with macros to help you do the layout and all this sort of thing. Anyway, to my amazement, I've got a more authentic um, an ancient set of super duper Tiroff macros for doing Bell Labs memos than even Brian had. So we were able, with a fair bit of effort, to recreate the memo at the sort of quality that would certainly have been obtainable from the 202 if only we'd hung on to the bromides. Yeah? But we didn't. However, this of course has all been done via postscript and PDF and modern technologies, but we're trying as hard as we possibly can to still retain the look and feel of what it would have looked like at best quality coming off the Linotronic 202. One of the best ways to show what we were up against and whether we succeeded or not was to show an AB comparison. Here is the original memo, not as a bromide as it should have been, but as a sort of nth order photocopy of it. First of all, finished off properly at the bottom. Don't forget, we didn't have the appearance of this. We didn't save the bromide. But what we did have was the TROF source code. Yeah, Brian had saved that, thank heavens. We would have been struggling without that, although in the end we could have rebuilt it with optical character recognition and all that, but he'd saved the TROF. So instead of running TROF through a back end to the 202, we now run TROF through another back end out to PostScript and PDF. So here we go. Nice and clean, no ink bleed, straight off a good quality laser printer. Our Bell Labs logo revived as a font character all over again and even shrunk down. It says here, the most obvious special character we use is the Bell System logo. I'm jumping ahead now. The thing that Brian was trying to get across in this memo was this. 
In this era, you mustn't imagine that the 202 and its characters were able to do splines and arcs and complex curves. No, they couldn't. I mean, quite apart from anything else, there wasn't the processor power to be able to do the computer graphics necessary to turn those into dots on the CRT fast enough. No, what you had to do was to simplify and make all your characters be lots and lots of small line segments. So these diagrams here, as you can see, I put little arrows on, they're not really part of the character, just to emphasize to you, this is where each line segment begins and ends. So that Helvetica font letter E is a bunch of straight lines. And there were severe limits on how many you could have at most of straight lines in any one character. But it worked well enough, so long as you didn't take your character size above about an inch at most, and then you began to be able to see the straight line approximations. The Naked Mini was going flat out, and even then it could just about cope with characters done as lots of straight lines. It certainly could not cope with arcs and splines. Okay, so let's just summarize the two big challenges that we faced in recreating this vacation memo. Fonts like Times Roman, Helvetica, Courier, if they're there, are no problem. They existed on the 202, but they've been brought forward into the postscript and true type modern fonts era. Those are easy to get hold of. The harder bits here was what we had to recreate because they just didn't exist except on the 202. The first and most obvious is Ken's chess font. So starting from first principles again, I created a few shapes using Brian's pick program and handed them over to my colleague Steve, whose photograph you've already seen, Steve Bagley. We also discovered by the by in doing this that Ken Thompson, faced with the problems of fonts on the 202, where individual characters shouldn't get too complex, you'll never guess how he did something like a pawn here on a shaded black background. The overall character would have been too complicated. So what he did was he created extra characters, which was the cutout shape at the back, partly shaded, and then dropped the pawn shape on top of them as a zero width character. So it's a superposition. We were authentic. We did that in our replica. The other thing which caused me many sleepless nights is that the Linotron font for doing program printouts, courier if you like, was called printout. Heaven knows why Linotype Mergenthaler didn't just do courier, but they didn't. Next thing to do is to phone up the font shop in Cheltenham and say, print out on the 202. It's been turned into postscript, hasn't it? By somebody, for some reason. Uh, no comes back the reply, it was 202 only. We never converted that one. So I decided to recreate it. In conjunction with my friend Chuck Bigelow, type designer, we had a look at this printout font in the Linotype fonts book. Chuck took one look at that. He said that's come from a variable width typewriter font, something like Excelsior, but they've hacked it about to make it a fixed pitch font like Courier. And he was quite right. If you look at the tiny details, you can see it's Excelsior messed about with. So with a sinking heart, I started off with Excelsior. I spent, I'm not exaggerating, 120 hours chopping stems, chopping down serifs, resizing, placing in fixed width character positions, trying all the kern pairs I could to get them to look right. It's not bad. I'm still not happy with it at all. <coughs> but it was a revelation to me as to just how incredibly labour-intensive type design is. But for the sake of authenticity, and when you look inside the vacation memo, you will see Brian wrote a heartfelt letter to Mergenthaler about the lack of reliability of their 202, and he wrote it in the printout font, so I wanted it to look right. So that just about summarises, I think, the big two challenges that we had to overcome, and uh, I think we're now just about completely succeeded. It's like restoring pictures. You don't want to over restore. You want to use exactly the original materials and do it just right. But overall, I'm pretty happy. I don't think we did too badly. All of your characters in the current font available as photographic images. What you've now got to do is to transfer the photographic image of the capital letter S, shall we say, from the strip onto 
a piece of photosensitive paper. You put this down into a thing that looks like a top-loading washing machine in a laundrette. 